Hansold Analytics presents the Intelligence Brief Podcast, OSINT and its application. In this episode, our host, Anne Lynn Dudenhofer, speaks with Dr. Shelley Whitman, Executive Director of the Dahlair Institute. Together, they will discuss early warning indicators of armed conflict, the development of predictive models, and the recruitment of children as soldiers. Welcome to the Intelligence Brief Podcast, OSINT and its application. My name is Lynn Dudenhofer and I'm the OSINT Analyst at Hensold Analytics. I'm here today with my guest, Dr. Shelley Whitman, Executive Director of the Delay Institute for Children, Peace and Security, formerly known as the Romeo Delay Child Soldier Initiative. I'm thrilled to have you as our guest today, Shelley. Would you be so kind to share a few sentences about yourself just so that our audience can get to know you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Anne Lynn, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I would just like to explain that I am the executive director of what is currently known as the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. We are based in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada on the Dalhousie University campus. And in terms of my work, I've been doing this role as the executive director for about the last 12 years. So it's been a huge part of who I am and the building of it from what was originally the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative to the Dallaire Institute has been something that has been an incredibly uh, proud moment for me. And uh, certainly my experience in working in Africa as well as in conflict mediation and at the United Nations through the uh, United Nations Children's Fund was my first professional job after coming out of my studies. It's been a wonderful opportunity to tie all of those elements together and to really understand how we can think about children, peace and security in a much different way. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, as I said, I'm thrilled to have you. Thanks for joining today. So just to give our audience a bit of an idea of what we will be discussing here today, I will provide some background info. And please correct me if I'm wrong at any stage. Um, over uh, 400 20 million children live in areas of um, that are affected by armed conflict, uh, which is apparently a 50% increase since the 1990s. So until recently, the efforts to tackle this child sol soldier recruitment have been largely reactive. And to break the cycle of violence and exploitation, it is required to address this issue preventatively. And what we would like to discuss today is uh, what value intelligence gathering and data collection can provide for the prevention of child soldier recruitment and exploitation? It's a great question. One of our biggest challenges has been collecting and collating and analyzing data that is relevant to children in the conflict zones that we're dealing with. First, you have to create an awareness of why it's even important to have that data. And then secondly, it's about ensuring we have data that is disaggregated by age. And even when we think about children, we tend to talk about them like they're this monolith, but the differences between a child who is, you know, a toddler uh, to a child who's a school age to a child who then um, is a teenager, there's so many different developmental dynamics that we have to understand. and the more we can make that awareness of the need to have uh, the differential data and what that means in terms of a better set of responses in terms of prevention is critically important for us to be able to work with those who are in positions to be able to collect the data and the reports. And oftentimes it's just not something on the radar. We just held our third annual Knowledge for Prevention Symposium in Kigali, Rwanda. And in that work, we are trying to address early warning indicators for conflict prevention. And many of the organizations who are working on early warning, we have scoured those particular systems. And what we have seen is there are zero indicators related to children, let alone disaggregated in the ways I just described. So just to get our listeners up to speed, um, could you maybe provide some more background information about the Dalea Institute and its core mission? 
So in terms of the Delair Institute, our core mission is trying to progressively end the recruitment and use of children as soldiers around the globe. And our vision is a world where we want to see the recruitment and use of children in armed violence as something that becomes unthinkable. So that if we ever enter into conditions of violence and war, the last thing we would think about would be recruiting and using children to participate in that violence or war. And so this core mission and vision comes from the lived experience of our founder, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, who's now retired, but was the UN force commander in 1994 during the Rwanda genocide. We conduct our work um, as a result of his experience trying to find ways to prevent the recruitment and use of children as something that he faced and was unprepared for during that time. I can imagine I would be totally unprepared for that as well. <laughs> so, I mean, you kind of said this already, but you took up the post of executive director of the Delay Institute in 2010. So what is your story? What motivated you to work with the Delay Institute specifically? Thank you for that question. So just to be clear, I had conducted research in my graduate studies on genocide, genocide prevention, and in particular, that coincided with the time of 1994, um, 1995. And so what was happening in the world in terms of Rwanda was something that was of great interest to me. And probably even of more interest to me was how little attention the world was paying to that conflict. And so I was curious as to the politics of when we intervene in conflicts and why don't we do more to alleviate the suffering. That led me to uh, then, so interesting, I had observed that there was a, a posting for a job at UNICEF headquarters in New York to work with a gentleman by the name of Stephen Lewis, who was a former Canadian ambassador to the United Nations and at that time was deputy director of UNICEF in New York. He had a posting for a job for a researcher to work on what was then called the Organization of African Unities panel uh, for the uh, investigation into the Rwanda genocide. So the OAU at that time created this panel and he needed a uh, young researchers to work with him to help him with with writing it and so I looked at that and I said that's that's me that's exactly the the job I'm I'm supposed to do and lo and behold uh, he I had the interview and he hired me and I came to New York and so what was so interesting about it is I worked at UNICEF headquarters and I was immersed in all of these issues related to children and armed conflict and child protection but I was working on this file of helping with the, the researching and writing of that particular report on genocide. It was actually the first time that I encountered uh, General Romeo Dallaire because we had an eight hour interview with him at that time about his experience. And so the combination of those two worlds was so fascinating for me. And it then also, uh, led me to the opportunity to meet a mom who had traveled all the way from Uganda because her daughter had been abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army at that time. And seeing the convergence of those issues, but also feeling so incredibly emotional about the fact that here was this woman who had traveled all the way to the UN to ask for help to get her child back. And I felt, again, why wasn't the world doing something more to address these issues and how could we remain silent? So uh, just, I know this is a bit of a long story that I'm giving you, but uh, from there, I was compelled to go to Africa to experience uh, many of these issues that I had been studying and writing about. And I had the opportunity to go and I ended up going to Botswana where I lived for seven years and I was hired to work for the former president of Botswana because he was the mediator for the inter-Congolese dialogue, the peace process in the DRC. 
So it was an actual progression from some of the work that I had been doing, but probably one of the most life-changing experiences for me to understand how peace processes do or don't work and all of the politics behind it. And I did that job for about two and a half years or so. And then I uh, stayed in Botswana and ended up lecturing at the university and, and working with young people there. And that eventually led to me making a decision to come back home after I started to have my own children and coming back to Canada. And I then had an opportunity to start to work at Dalhousie University uh, as a lecturer and then to take on the role of the deputy director of the Center for Foreign Policy Studies that existed at Dalhousie at the time. But when I took on that role, I was really clear that I would only take it on if I could reshape the Center for Foreign Policy Studies and have some of the issues that I was passionate about part of it. They agreed and it then led to me being um, involved with the initial beginnings of what General Dallaire was creating for the Child Soldiers Initiative out of his research work that he had been doing on it. And then I took up uh, getting involved with his work at that time to eventually a, a decision that he and those who had been involved at that time said, this initiative needs a home. And it seems that the person who would be the best place to take it on would be Shelley. And so could we place it at Dalhousie? I agreed uh, to doing that. And in January, 2010, I took it on and felt that it was something that could be built uh, with very, very little resources, almost no staff at the time uh, to what we are now today, uh, almost 12 years later. Okay, let's let's dive right in. A uh, complex situation, short question. What are some of the main push and pull factors for the recruitment of child soldiers, for example, on the African continent? So this is a bit of a complex question, of course, because the push and pull factors have been varying uh, depending on context and time and place. But there are some common factors that we can look at. And so on the one hand, uh, you have you know, some of the factors that are related to whether or not you have uh, large populations of children who are in an area where it's impacted by conflict. And those factors such as high levels of poverty, uh, lack of employment, uh, education opportunities that are limited, whether or not there's general insecurity that prevents children from being able to venture to school uh, or back, et cetera. And so those are some factors that we, we understand um, that are very important. But I think that even more importantly, what we are understanding more and more is that while those factors are important, probably some of the factors that are even more important are related to things such as whether or not a young person feels a sense of purpose and do they understand their sense of, of purpose and do they have a family that supports them in finding that, whether or not they feel revenge because of having experienced or witnessed violations against their community or their families if they feel a sense of powerlessness. So an inability to impact kind of injustices and wrongs that they have observed and aspects also related to their identity. So uh, these elements of who are they and um, what are their belief systems and uh, whether or not the communities in which they are in help them with understanding all of these elements tend to be much more common globally than we, we tend to understand. And so while you asked me the question about Africa and those perspectives, those last four points that I raised are things that are relevant right here in Canada when we think about youth involved in criminal networks and gangs or extremist groups in places like Europe as well. Yeah, fair enough. I think the last one in particular is a good point that it's kind of universal anyway um, in youth all over the place. Um, but talking about prevention now, um, in one of your publications, I think, on preventing child soldier recruitment, you mentioned that to progressively end the recruitment 
and use of children as soldiers, practitioners must focus on effective prevention. And I think you also state that a transformational shift is needed to move from merely good intentions to preventive action or preventative action. So what is your definition of effective prevention in this context as opposed to ineffective prevention? Yeah, great question. So I think that one of the challenges that I'm always posing to those who are working in this field, whether it's non-governmental organizations or the United Nations or governments that we collaborate with is we use the word prevention, but we really uh, in action are focusing on you know, remedies after the fact. So if we're serious about prevention, what we need to understand is that when we think about protection of children and we think about access to some of the most basic services that children need from healthcare to education, to social services, to uh, effective security, oftentimes those particular areas that most impact children are also the areas where we put the least resources into. So many parts of the world, education um, is the thing that is suffers the most from uh, cuts. I know here too in our country, when we talk with teachers and educators, they will continuously complain about how every year there's something else that gets cut. Why do we do that if we're quite serious about wanting to protect children? And the you know, extreme importance of that is something for us to, to really think about. And yet it doesn't seem as if spending on things like military um, expenditures is, is reduced in the same way. So there's a reallocation of the way that we think and the way that we prioritize. And that you know, goes throughout um, all of the areas of, of the ways in which we prioritize what we do in, in our day-to-day -day lives, in government. Um, certainly, I, I think that if you use the COVID-19 pandemic as an example too, the measures that we put in place uh, we did not think very clearly about the impacts that that would have on children. And I know, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this period and have all kinds of studies that are going to talk about the impacts on the COVID-19 kids and, and what um, occurred as a result. So again, it's about putting children at the heart of all of the decisions that we are making, thinking through the long-term kind of implications of it and whether or not the approaches that we are taking have a child sensitive uh, approach to it and dynamic. And that's you know, a pretty broad answer, but I'm, I'm trying to get the audience to understand it. It's a transformational shift in the way we think about the order and priority of the world. I don't mind a broad answer because uh, there, are, there are more questions to come anyway. <laughs> and we all need some sort of introduction to this topic because most of us, I, I assume, would not be aware, even if we come from a background of peace and conflict studies, for example. As you said, it's mostly not focused on, on children or at least doesn't put children at the forefront of the conversation. And this ties up neatly with my next question already, namely um, prevention is a well-known subject in the realm of peace and conflict, obviously, but one of the Delays Institute's goals is to put children at the forefront of this conversation, like you said. So what new methodologies are required to enhance existing knowledge and gain a better understanding of the recruitment of child soldiers? And maybe you could mention some of these new methodologies. From our perspective, one of the core areas that we've worked on is to improve the security sector actors' responses and their both their tactical as well as their strategic preparation for contexts in which children might be vulnerable and, and where we're seeing the potentials for them to be recruited and used. So uh, really interesting for us is that over these you know, past 12 years, we've worked really, really hard in understanding that perspective. What is their role? What can they do? Where are the points of collaboration and what we would call strategic complementarity where, you know, whether it's uh, non-governmental organizations they might need to understand how to collaborate with or whether it's 
uh, better use of things like intelligence gathering to understand the context on the ground and the realities of uh, their approaches. And so maybe if I could use um, an example that we're currently working in, at this very moment, uh, we are engaged in Mozambique. And in our work in Mozambique, over the past year and a half or so through this predictive model that we've created about understanding early warning potentials for children to be recruited and used in conflicts, Mozambique had flagged very early to us as an area where there was great potential for recruitment and use of children through all of the signs that we were seeing. And so we used that information to also flag it at the level of the United Nations with the Secretary uh, General's uh, office and thinking through the children in armed conflict agenda. But we also flagged it to SADX, the Southern African Development Community and their organ on politics and defense. It led to a communique being issued by them to understand that this was something that was serious for them to, to recognize in terms of their response to the insurgency that was happening in Cabo Delgado in the northern region of Mozambique. And then it also led to UNICEF in Mozambique connecting with us and saying to us, we need your help with working with the Mozambican armed forces. They need training, they need sensitization, they need understanding. So we are now doing that. Uh, we've got, reached an agreement with UNICEF and we've started training over the last uh, two weeks with the Mozambican Armed Forces to prepare them for their interactions with children. And why this is so important is because if they should go into a situation like Cabo Delgado and not have this information, it could result in them a missing key opportunities for better community engagement. It can also uh, result in them reacting in a very heavy handed way when they come across children who might be uh, recruited and used by those groups. And when that occurs, all it does is feeds into the insurgent group approach to try to decrease you know, the confidence in the security forces. And when that occurs, that leads to more recruitment and use um, capabilities. And so Right now, that is part of what we are really focusing on. And we believe that every time uh, armed forces go into context, whether they're in peacekeeping settings or whether their own uh, approach in their own countries to protect uh, their populations or their border areas, if they're not prepared for those interactions. What they do is they leave the door wide open for those who wanna recruit and use children and to exploit that vulnerability. Yeah, so essentially, I think what you summed up nicely there is um, the increase in, increase in social situational awareness that is required for um, all security forces that are going into an area or region. Um, and um, this also touches upon my next question, I reckon, um, namely, one of the Dalaius Institute's projects is called Knowledge for Prevention, which you've already mentioned because that's where you've just been last week. And um, it's designed to address ongoing research and policy gaps around children's recruitment and use in armed violence. So part of this project, if I understand correctly, is the development of a predictive model for estimating the likelihood of children's vulnerability to recruitment. Could you provide more details about the data sets this model is based on? So we have uh, data sets that have been provided to us by some researchers uh, around the world. Uh, I'm not sure if I can mention who those researchers are, uh, but I would like to say that uh, those researchers who provided those data sets have given us permission to, to have those and from uh, particular regions uh, of the world. And the more that we're uh, collating those uh, research uh, pieces, the data sets. We converge those data sets together to continue to look for the child-centered indicators and how we can use those data sets to also be combined with other data sets on conflict. And uh, when we bring them together, we're, con we're seeing patterns. Uh, we're currently now working on what we call version 2.0 of the um, 
K4P predictive model. So we've had the first version and we've had uh, some, some really interesting results that have come about from that. The first interesting result is that we, with about an 86% reliability could predict two years out when we would see potential recruitment and use of children in the conflict zones. What we couldn't do very well with that first version though is predict what we would call not child soldier use. So we, we couldn't predict with a certainty of when yes, but not a certainty of not child soldier use. So that was less reliable. So now in this next round, we're trying to get into some deeper indicators, which would help us to be able to understand a bit better why in this situation we were able to predict it really well. And in another situation, how would we understand what the difference would be that would, would result in not child soldier use? So for an example, the kind of focus that we have right now on understanding things like different cultural indicators that could make a difference for us. And those are really fascinating pieces and can be very different. And for example, if you look at Latin America, there are some elements culturally uh, when it comes to children that could be very different from an area such as Asia or in African um, contexts that we're in and even across different uh, ethnicities and groups within a same uh, country, there could be elements there that would be very important for us to understand. So, so those are some of the areas we're working on now to further develop the indicators. Just out of interest, what is one of the main predictive indicators of um, child soldier recruitment in an area, for example? So in the first version, what we were seeing is that um, some of the key things that were common for us to understand were whether or not there had been a previous conflict uh, in, in that particular country, whether or not it was a coup attempt, um, whether or not the state forces had recruited and used children. So what we are seeing is that when the state forces recruit and use children, the likelihood of non-state armed groups to use children goes up exponentially. And right now we have seven state armed forces around the world that are still recruiting and using children. And so that the kind of interesting logic there. And then whether or not there had been any history in the past of the recruitment and use of children um, in that conflict. So, you know, in Mozambique, you did have that uh, situation 20 years ago, you did have a previous conflict and coup attempt. And uh, then I think the last point is the duration of the conflict. And so what we have also seen is that um, the, the situation was where we have um, children recruited and used, you see that you have a much longer duration of conflict. And so uh, if you compared it to conflicts where there's no recruitment and use, it's three times as long for a conflict that has recruitment and use of children. And so understanding duration is also an important element for us. Very interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated. Thank you. Um, so moving on to my next question for you. Um, regarding the OSINT open source intelligence, a uh, focus of the Hensold Analytics media mining system in my particular background in intelligence analysis, I'm obviously very interested to hear your opinion regarding uh, the ways in which intelligence can add value to the prevention of sh child soldier recruitment. Are there any stages at which intelligence can be particularly helpful like to, to identify vulnerabilities and protect children from exploitation? Yeah, so you know what, there's probably so many things that I'm not completely aware of, but I would think that there are so many ways that intelligence is gathered, especially things that are related to, you know, geospatial um, information or aerial photography or aspects related to climate change indicators, you know, things like uh, water shortages, like it's so fascinating to me to look at as an example, uh, Madagascar right now, if you're aware of how devastating the impact of drought is there at the moment and, and how do those things drive up potential for uh, children's vulnerabilities, right? So I think um, there are so many different 
dynamics that we could certainly understand just from uh, more generally in terms of intelligence gathering. But I also think what would be exceptionally important is the more we can pinpoint down to um, a community level, uh, it's often challenging for us to have data that is so specific to a particular community or area. But again, if I reference the Cabo Delgado situation with Mozambique, the really important thing about having information that's pinpointed down to a smaller geographic region, the quicker our ability to react to it means that we would have a chance of preventing it from spreading wider, right? And so when we can see uh, population movements, um, and we can understand some of the challenges, as I said, whether it's climate change, agriculture, or aspects that are uh, potentially related to even things like resource extraction, right? Those are, that's, those are huge implications for us to, to understand. So the more we can bring those elements together to try to understand what are the patterns uh, that we can be aware of and how can we understand some of the early warning pieces. And I wanted to just give you know, one more uh, dynamic that's really important to understand. As we were having discussions with a particular participant at our conference last week who is working in the DRC with the MONUSCO, with the UN mission there, and she was giving us some data that they were collecting from children who had been recruited and used. And the interesting pieces about that data, it was so fascinating to look at things like the duration of the time that the children were engaged with the armed groups they might've been recruited and used in. And so if we can also understand the length of time that a child may be a part of an armed group, there's a period there where if we can get them out um, at a much earlier phase, we're gonna go a long way to preventing others from being recruited and used. And we're gonna prevent uh, them from you know, really becoming so indoctrinated that it becomes a challenge to, to reverse those, those dynamics. So Globally, there's things we can understand. And then more at a local level, there would be very interesting sets of dynamics we could try to, to read into, as well as finding ways to collate the data a little bit differently um, from, from the, the children themselves and how that could be used to impact the things we might look at and the patterns we, we might need to understand. I ran an open source intelligence analysis of the attack on, on Palma um, earlier this year in, in March. Um, uh, well, it stretched from March to April, really. I always say that um, open source intelligence is a, is a great, it's a great method, um, for example, even on the African continent where there isn't a great, a great social media coverage, you can still monitor TV and radio. Um, but then if you combine that with, for example, imagery intelligence, geospatial intelligence, as you said, and then also human intelligence, um, for example, um, researchers, locals, um, NGOs on the ground, then you really get a whole impression of what is going on. So um, I always uh, think that the combination of these methods is really, really um, what is valuable. So I, regarding early warning systems, and predictive model modeling. I think, uh, especially in the security sector, they're often overused as buzzwords, right? So what are some of the real life issues surrounding early warning systems in your opinion? I think the first thing which I did mention a bit earlier was just, first of all, early warning systems needing to have even the thought to have indicators related to children, right? What are, what are they looking at? Um, and so understanding what some of those indicators might be, they might be related to school enrollment. Have school enrollment gone down over the past six months? Uh, are there patterns in which children would typically be playing in particular fields or areas uh, that they are no longer uh, a part of and why? A really interesting thing also is related to aspects like children, uh, children who are working, children who might be doing things like helping out with agriculture. You know, are they no longer um, doing that kind of work because they're being drawn into something more lucrative? 
Um, thinking through dynamics also related to uh, faith-based dynamics. Um, what are the teachings that might be happening? What are the things that are uh, being discussed in sermons as well as uh, thinking through patterns of uh, elections or um, youth groups associated with political parties. And, and, and I think, you know, to your point about some of those open source um, processes, it's also the social media, right? Young people are oftentimes like five steps ahead of adults in the newest and latest when it comes to whichever uh, type of social media platform they might be using. So, you know, as a as a parent of four boys, I can tell you that if I want to understand something about uh, social media, it's them who teaches me and and can tell you that you know no mom that's that's passe. Nobody's looking at that anymore, right? So. This, you know, this kind of uh, dynamic where we might want to understand like a youth informed approach to what would be the things that would be the most important indicators for them would also be an important element for us to look at. Are there any technological advancements or advances that have recently rendered uh, the Deleuze Institute's mission to protect children from exploitation more difficult or more dangerous? It's a good question, and I don't have a particularly good answer to it because we have only just gotten into the mode of the predictive model being created. And now what we're trying to focus on is how do we take that predictive model and create what we would call a series of potential responses. So the Mozambique context is the first time that we took the predictive model and said, well, here's what our response would be. And now we are in the midst of providing that response and hoping that we'd be able to collect the impacts uh, on, on the potential of what we were able to do to try to avert and, and reduce child soldier recruitment. So um, there are other contexts in which we get what we call a worry list every month on potentials. But we don't always have the programmatic connections in those countries because we're pretty, we're pretty small. But what we need to do is be able to build partnerships and have a set of responses that we're trialing right now to see which response would actually lead to the best potential outcomes. And this is probably our greatest differential with other organizations working on early warning where they tend to flag the warning and they put out the reports which flag the warning but they don't have a response and what we're trying to do is to bridge that gap of saying well we're not the early warning specialists but we're specialists on preventing recruitment and use of children how can we work with some of those big early warning systems that exist and then take the potentiality for the recruitment and use and partner, whether it's with UN partners, NATO, the African Union, to countries that we have partnerships like Rwanda, for example, who's you know a huge contributor to peacekeeping on the African continent. Are there those partners we can work with and we can tell them, here's the information we understand, and these are the responses that are required to prevent recruitment and use. And if we could do that, and we could show a few examples of where what we've done has actually worked, we truly believe that what we do could be transformational. I absolutely agree. I, I think it could be transformational. And um, I am obviously very interested as an analyst to uh, see more um, child sensitive data sets included. Um, so. Yes, I'm, I'm closely going to be following your development. And um, for today, this uh, sum actually sums up our Intelligence Brief podcast. Um, thank you for joining me, Shelley. And thanks so much for sharing your insights. It's been a pleasure. And um, to our audience, uh, very happy to have you listen in to our first episode. And please feel free to contact me or Shelley if you happen to have any questions. Thank you, anne -Lynn. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Follow us on your usual podcast platform and tune in for our next episode of the Intelligence Brief Podcast.